What's up, everyone? Love the face on video. Tori, what's up, man? Congratulations. Great to see you. I don't know if you're like doing something with the hair, but it feels like it's working, man. It feels like it's working. <laughs> Good to have you here. <laughs> Matt, great to see you, man. Love here. And I uh I talked to Providence the other day and they talked about the how much they enjoy working with you. So just wanted to let you know that you're doing a great job over there. Liam's back too. Great to have you here. Hey, Reagan. Um, let's see. I can kind of see it's like far away, but I can kind of see we've got like 25, 30 people in here, which is amazing. Um, awesome. Other people flow through. We'll let them join in. Um, for some people that uh, we got several people that were like early attendees of uh, Demand Gen Live. Um, and I'm going back to sort of a format like that, but we're going to we talked about a lot of different stuff in Demand Gen Live, but sort of elevate the conversation into full go to market. Um, and so digital demand will be one category, revenue operations will be a category, events and field, outbound, data and analytics, how you get your strategy off that. So we're just going to expand out the topics that uh, the topics that we're going to focus on here. Um, love the format of me sort of getting the conversation started for a little while, the things that I'm seeing or hot topics or trends that have come up. Um, and then move it back down into the the more of the Q&A session where we have a fluid conversation. People can share their perspective and ask questions. We can go through uh, all of that. So I'm really excited to be back. We had this event be private for our vault community. We're shifting the strategy of how we do that and making this uh, a full public event. Um, the event uh, is run by me, Chris Walker, and it'll be available on the B2B Revenue Vitals podcast. Um, it is sponsored by Refine Labs, the B2B digital demand agency, uh, Passetto, our go-to-market consultancy that I just announced recently, as well as Hatch, who I'm a limited a limited partner and investor in the company called Hatch, which is a content post-production agency. And so looking forward, I guess we can call this episode one for right now. We'll mark it as episode one and we'll give it a name later or something like that. But looking forward to diving in. The one topic that I want to sort of cover to get it started and we'll see where it goes, I might sort of expand and go in different directions um, is the, is the concept of whether you're looking at it in just the marketing budget, or if you've, if you're m more mature and looking at it in the entire go to market, including CS and account management sales and SDRs, there is such an incredible benefit of evaluating your investments and categorizing your investments across the customer life cycle in this way. Number one is that you need to create demand and you're going to have investments and in things about how you create demand. You need to capture intent. Once a, once a company wants to buy your stuff and they're showing intent to buy, you need to be able to capture that intent into a sales conversation, a free trial, or whatever your main go-to-market motions are. Then you need to convert pipeline. You need to convert pipeline from a stage one opportunity to closed one. And you have investments and tactics and strategies around how are we going to win more deals at higher ACVs? How are we going to close them faster? And then you have account expansion, expand accounts. Those are the four main buckets of a customer life cycle. Create demand is not awareness. We, that is not the goal of demand creation. It is not to get someone to know that our company exists. It's to for, them, for a company and the individuals inside of that company to want to buy our product to a level where they're demonstrating clear intent to buy. That is the goal of demand creation. And so when you take your entire marketing budget of and you could look at this just at programs or at or with headcount and programs and you force fit every single one of your expenses into one of those four categories you probably do some of it already but like it's not grouping it into digital and field and customer marketing anymore it's the against the customer life cycles and you force fit all the expenses into those things you'll start to see the balance or often imbalance of the investments across that spectrum and it can go in either direction. I often talk about how companies underinvest in demand creation when you actually do this, but I was analyzing a company recently and 56% of their marketing budget was spent on customer marketing or account expand, better framed as account expansion, um, dis despite most of the revenue coming from net new business. And so you can clearly see, am I balanced or imbalanced and how could I allocate investments? It'll also like force you to say, is this thing that we're, is this event that we're running, is it focused on converting pipeline, or capturing demand or creating demand? And based on that decision, you would run an entirely different event and you would measure it differently as well. Um, 
And so I think that view, and and we're going to be publishing sort of more, I'm going to start blogging again, I'm going to start blogging, because I think written content can be very helpful in communicating these types of things. Um, start publishing more content about the breakdown and what we're finding when we start to look at it in this way. Um, I think another core concept that I'm, I continue to see uh, come up that I kind of want to share um, is, is the shift in movement from a company that determines like the source or the credit based on the department, like, oh, did marketing sales or SDRs do that? Um, and shifting it to, from the buyer's perspective, a, con uh, a concept that we've called pipeline sources, which is not based on a department. It's based on a clear intent signal from the buyer before they engage with your sales team, which would be, in, which would be website, events, outbound, partner, product. Um, there's different pipeline sources for that. And when you, sh when you shift that, it takes you out of the silos of marketing and sales and SDRs, and then the budget budgeting in silos, the analytics in silos, and the optimization in silos. And it gives you a view of the entire go-to-market running at one time. Um, I know that we had a bunch of questions come in. So I think with that, we'll sort of, we'll go mainly questions on this one. Everyone knows I'm doing an event with Dave on Thursday. I think that one will be a more of a prologue as we talk about community and content. So feel free to register for that. Someone will drop a link on that as well. Um, but yeah, I think from now, let's uh, let's open it up into questions. Great to have everyone here. Really appreciate uh, you being here and looking forward to uh, future episodes. Thanks, everyone. All right. Feel free to drop your questions in the chat and I'll bring you on live. We always prioritize live questions and back and forth. I'm going to kick things off with a pre-submitted question. So this one... Uh, Refine Labs talks a lot about changing the lead gen to demand gen approach. As with many strategies and tactics, though, sometimes these scenarios, when sometimes there are scenarios when running a lead gen campaign can actually work. So I hear. Can you share more nuanced perspective of how you think about this transition and possibly some use cases where you would support a lead gen? approach or a lead generation campaign yeah the whole the whole premise of uh of shifting from a lead gen to demand gen strategy is that you've run a split the funnel analysis analyzed every single lead source looked at the disposition of those leads from lead to qualified pipeline to close one revenue you've tried to estimate the cost of acquisition and the sales velocity and the sales productivity around there and then you're basically going to have groups of things. You're going to have things that are very low productivity that should stop. There's things that might be doing okay, or jet, like you could argue that they're acceptable and we should try and figure out how to just improve them. And then you might have a couple of things that are working well. Um, and in those cases, those things would be, how do we pour gas in the fire and make these things work better? Um, all of the recommendations of moving away from lead gen are based on data and should be easily collected and easily analyzed data because you're getting a lead, your sales team is immediately taking action, and then you're going to know the disposition of that action. Um, and so that is the like effectively the core thesis when you think about a lead gen to demand gen strategy. We've done analysis recently, and they're and they're rare. I will say that they're rare for the most part. Companies that run a low intent lead gen strategy through content syndication, LinkedIn, uh, you know, broad match keywords on Google ads, uh, even SEO organic to like a ebook download, anything like that, they win one out of a thousand conversions. That means sales follows up with 999 people that don't buy to win one deal, which in most cases is highly unproductive and not going to scale. Um, there are some uh, there's some edge cases where companies do have lead gen channels that are working. Um, for instance, we analyzed one company that was using account-based marketing to filter accounts and identify intent of those accounts, and then deploying content syndication against the key people inside of those accounts and having success. That company is also has an incredible product, has an incredible brand, has the leading media property in the industry has a lot of other things that are working for them, and they had success with that channel. You could also think about, is this a correlation, not a causation? Was it actually the uh, that we filtered the right accounts and that they had intent that was the reason why this was successful, not necessarily the content syndication vendor that did it? Um, 
And then there was another one that we've seen with a low ACV product that ran performance marketing inside of Facebook uh, and LinkedIn mm -hmm. at a high volume and had a great uh, like CAC and CAC payback period against it. But the offer was incredible. It was a it was an offer that you can't say no to, which is very rare, which is we'll give all this stuff for you for free. When you use it, you make money and there's no downside risk to you. And all the only thing that happens is you use it and you make money. Um, and there's just not that many offers like that in the B2B SaaS world. So um, I do think that if you have a clear, compelling offer, the performance marketing is an incredible strategy. Um, and I do think that if you have a great brand, a great content engine and other things like that, that certain lead gen strategies and channels could play out for you. Uh, but I'm com communicating the trend and the clear pattern that I see across lots of companies. Metadata released a study in, in the middle of last year with that I analyzed personally and started to confirm some of this. The data that they have across $45 million or $50 million in total advertising spend and all the leads against that. And the data that I've collected across a lot of companies over five years almost perfectly matched in terms of the statistics like win rate, uh, average customer acquisition cost, cost per lead, conversion rates, things like that. Um, and so broadly, I think it's clear based on data that now that a majority of lead gen strategies are very, very low productivity um, and could be cut immediately. But there are going to be some edge cases where you should look at your own data to validate that before you make these types of decisions. And if you find one that's working, I think that you should be leaning into it. Awesome. We got some uh, notes in the chat that newsletter signups have been working. Um, quality, you have to have a great newsletter. <laughs> and um, some event signups have been working for a couple of people in the chat. Okay, um, I'm going to bring on Evan, who has a question for you, Chris. Ask him to mute. Oh. Awesome. What's up, Chris? <clears throat> Yo, dude, good to see you. You too. So this new, question, new year, same background. I, I love that background. Yeah, I mean, it's painted on the walls. I can't paint my walls every year. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool. The question that I have is kind of more specific to thinking about measurement. So we've really anchored around this idea of having predictable pipeline and forecasting. So heroes become kind of the true North star that we're, you know, champion in general across all SaaS kind of measurement. I think one of the challenges we've seen a lot of clients and or just other people I've talked to in the space have wondered what metrics they should think about optimizing towards when there's a long sales cycle. So say the sales cycle is nine to 12 months. So there's a limited volume of data. They have a high ACV of greater than two to 300,000. And it's hard to like get the buy-in that we need to use Hero as our point of reference. So what metrics do you suggest or have you seen valuable in the conversation to move up funnel a little bit to still kind of see the momentum? Yeah, in this situation and many others, I think the primary top level metric is actually what we would call account engagement. Um, so using an ABM platform or other form of uh, account de-anonymization to say, of our target account list, how many of those target accounts are on our website and what will we estimate is the cost to get a, a, a target account of the right person engaged on our website. That'd be like the number one metric, which would, I think, be a lot more. It's not an MQA necessarily. They're not like ready for sales to reach out, but you have that first action. Um, then you would have some level below that, which we would consider an account conversion. So that account does does something that moves them in from demand capture to demand conversion. They convert on a demo. Your SDR team reaches out and they respond. They fill out a lead form at your event a lot of other reasons, and then that would move them to the next level. And then you have hero below that, which is in deal progression. So you have account engagement, like what percentage or how, what volume of our target accounts are on our website. In long sales cycles, that visibility can be highly effective in showing people that you're making progress without any tangible pipeline. Um, so I think, and most of the companies that we work with at this point have an ABM software and so figuring out how to leverage that to measure two different stages one first party just website engagement from that account and then lower like you could either adopt like a six cents like ai generated six qa methodology as the next level down or like a uh, like demand base i think offers an ability for you to customize what that criteria actually is um, so then you could have an account conversion which would basically be we have an opportunity to create pipeline of this account if we can follow up and get a meeting and then lastly would be the the move to hero and hero should be the the like 
the main metric that you look at, but you have some more upper funnel ones for early indicators or to show progress when you just get started. And the last thing I'll say um, is that if, especially through like the website pipeline source, but often others that even in a long sales cycle, you should be able to get to hero relatively quickly. I think 30 to 60 days, um, even though the rest of the process might take a long time. When you, when you see a very long period of time happening from like opportunity created to hero stage, it means that our sales team's talking to people that don't want to buy oftentimes. Um, so it can be that distance between opportunity creation and hero date being a really long date or a, a large percentage of the sales cycle can actually be an indicator of like, hey, our sales team's engaging with people too, like either too early in the process. We need to think about how to create demand more, get the right people, right accounts at the right time into the pipeline. Awesome. Yep, that makes sense. I think the threshold part is like dependent. There's a lot of dependencies on kind of what triggers you're looking for to identify some sort of readiness to engage because we, you know, you kind of the argument could hold true that lower quality lead gen is not a viable like trigger for somebody to want to reach mm -hmm. out to reach out to these contacts. So I think that's just where I always compete with myself is like it's similar to looking for cost for qualified job title, but we have to move knowing that there's not a high volume of the you know, contacts engaging with certain content. So that's just where I always struggle. Not, yeah, not it's something that I'm going to continue to like work on and optimize. But I think just a first a first party account website hit could be considered the engagement, the first stage. And then when you think about the conversion, I totally agree that what should happen is every single signal where our sales teams take action, it's measured. So, you know, intent data signal, measure, SDR takes action, disposition. You know, someone fills out a lead gen form, it's measured, SDR takes action, disposition. And you do that at a big company, you have a million data points over a year that you can look at. And then you can start to find the patterns of this intense signal is, drives high productivity. These conversions on our website do. These, you know, X, Y, and Z things do. And conversely, you can identify here are all the things that aren't. Here are the things where our sales team engages a thousand times to get one meeting or something like that. Um, and most companies just don't have the granularity of the tracking at that point. Uh, it's something that uh, that I'm working on. Also, some uh, many other marketing ops firms are working on a good solution to that. But uh, for the most part, companies don't have that in place yet. They do for like basic lead gen channels, but there's a whole black hole and outbound about like what is actually driving an SDR to do something, and how can we be able to measure that to optimize? It's so it's crazy. Some people have been talking about this. It's resonated with me. Marketing is all like has always been built around this idea of like continuous optimization, you know, CRO looking at data, but SDRs haven't. And it's almost the exact same thing. The subject line, the email, the channel, you know, what you say, why you reach out, what time, why, like the, the same conversion principles could take place in outbound, but simply aren't there. And the data isn't there yet either for most part to be able to take action on. I think that's another interesting, not necessarily for Refine Labs, but I think that's another interesting problem in the market to solve. Sure. Awesome. Appreciate it. All right. We've got Nancy kind of has a follow-up question around lead gen. Good morning. So first of all, uh, this is my first time joining this and I find it fascinating. Uh, I, Good to I, have you. Thank you. I wanted to give a shout out for to Sydney, who uh, did a great job on YouTube. Uh, I found a video, and this is how I found out about this um, event. Awesome. Uh, and, uh, uh, thank you to Megan, who gave me a private tutorial last week when I was stuck in Aspen, and my flight got delayed. So <laughs> all this is super helpful. So anyway, my question now is, do you see that Legion works differently depending on the stage of the company. Example, if you're an early startup that doesn't have enough closed business to do a hero analysis, uh, do you believe that you have to rely, rely on demand gen programs to build pipe and get started? Um, I, I think like better defining the stage the stage would help on this. I think from zero to 1 million ARR, it's like network founder sales, you know, strategic outbound from a founder, VC relationships. I think it's very scrappy from zero to a million. Yeah. Um, I think as you as you mature out of the 1 million, that a lot of the that the data starts to build over time. And it doesn't take you that long, like even qualitatively. I did this at a company that was a, like one a little over a million in revenue when I joined them. 
and you run a you run, we ran Facebook ads. We got 550 leads. The SDR said these leads weren't good. The sales team didn't convert them into pipeline. And within a week, we we knew that this lead gen channel, or at least this strategy inside of this channel, is not going to be an effective strategy. So I think you can still get that feedback fast. Um, when we think about the differences, actually, what I find is that the results are pretty consistent, regardless of company stage. Um, and if you look at the averages of the the large aggregated anonymized metadata report that was put out, the that's like it could be hundreds of companies and fifty million dollars in spend and two hundred and forty thousand leads collected or something. It's a very large number. Um, and the averages converge on about what I see, which is when you run a low intent lead gen strategy through content syndication, through you know a performance marketing on a social channel, and things like that that you typically will win one out of a thousand of those leads into a customer within the next 12 to 24 months. Um, Yeah. Sorry. But however, I see that most early startups will rely on like Google ads, right. And they'll rely on webinars as their kind of go-to initial uh, strategy. Do you define that as a kind of a low intent conversion? Uh yeah, big companies allocate that way too. Big companies are most heavily invested in Google ads for the most part from a digital perspective, and they do a lot of webinars. So again, there's like some matches there. It depends on how the channel is being used. Like if you're if we ran a webinar like this right now at a company, right? Our Series A company, and then you asked this question, and then I followed up with you right after it said, Hey, thanks for joining the webinar. Uh, do you want a demo of our product? Like that that's it depends how it's being used and then in google ads the same thing if the person is searching for your brand and they're coming in and buying then that's a whole different story than someone searching how do i get the answer from this landing on some blog with your ebook downloading the ebook and then you cold calling them um and so uh it's really interesting to think it's not really about the channel or the program it's about how it's being used and then trying to understand the intent of the buyer at the time of the sales outreach. Um, so I think there's, uh, uh, I wish it was more cut and dry, but there are, does seem to be quite a bit of nuance. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks for being here. Sure. All right, we've got another one. This one is from Tara. She's driving in her car right now, so I'm going to read it for her. So love to dig into how you track and what core metrics you would track under each of the investment buckets that you went over earlier. Uh, create demand, capture demand, convert demand, and expand demand. Could you outline that? Yeah, I've actually, and I'm starting to pioneer a, a, like a new terminology for this, just make it more clear for people. Create demand, capture intent, convert pipeline, expand accounts. Uh, rather than just having to be demand across the whole thing, it's a lot more clear. There's a lot more clarity there. Um, so, and if you had investments in each of these things, then you could have a clear sort of defined way to look at each of these and, and scrutinize these investments in theory. Um, I'll start in the ones that become the easiest. So I think that the easiest one to evaluate is the uh, capture intent bucket. A buyer is showing intent, we are investing money to take a certain action, and then we are going to either, you know, capture that intent into a meeting and future pipeline, or we're not. Um, and so that one becomes, so Google ads would fall into that PPC on review sites. You could argue that performance marketing for retargeting audiences could fill in here. Uh, SDR outbound on a uh, intent data signal or a website visit or something like that. Um, there's a variety of investments that go into a majority of investments actually go into capture intent. Um, and so you'd be able to look and like for Google ads, for instance, buyers showing intent, we buy the ad, we either convert them or that we don't on the landing page, we either get them into a meeting or we don't, we either get them into pipeline or we don't, et cetera, et cetera. And so you'd be able to evaluate the spend of that channel and then the outcome. SDRs could be looked at almost in, in the same way. We invest so much in headcount. There are signals coming in through SDRs. Then we're going outbound. We have a success rate to that. We create a certain amount of pipeline and revenue against that, and we're able to evaluate that. It's the one place where this like direct, like we call it a tipping point, where direct ROI is really important. 
Now, the problem that people uh, have run into before is that they try to they historically use that model to deem 100 percent credit for the deal based on that point. And that is not the right way and why, a reason why many people have moved away from it. Um, but we could look at that and deem it as the success criteria for capturing intent specifically. And then we would have a different measurement to look at the demand creation motion and a different measurement to look at the other stages. Now let's look at uh, convert pipeline. So convert pipeline examples of this. Um, we used to do this back in the day where like if we had an account in stage four pipeline that like our medical director or chief of innovation or someone like that would fly out with the sales leader and the CSM. They'd have a meeting with a big account and we try to use that to close the deal or accelerate the pipeline. That is an investment that we're making in sales marketing or some other form of go-to-market to try and influence or increase the probability of the success of winning the deal, closing it faster, getting a bigger ACV, or some form of that, of some combination of those. Um, "Quote unquote digital air cover to the buying group of Ac active pipeline would be another one. It's probably something that uh, we've done quite a bit at Refine Labs. So, you know, opportunity created." And then look at the account and then get the right contacts on that account or get the right job titles in that account and then advertise against that, whether it's personalized or more broad, um, and be able to use that investment. And the goal of that investment is to increase the sales velocity of those deals that are already in pipeline. And then the way to tease out the effectiveness of those investments is a, is a little less clear. Um, I think there are some tools coming out that are doing... Uh, holdout groups and other forms of statistics that could prove to be useful in the future, although I haven't experimented enough to know. Um, other companies, like what we did back in the day when we did those events, we just built it into our CAC. It was like when we get an account that far and we win 60% of those, those deals, we are going to make an investment to try and win more of them and win them faster. And that became just part of the motion. We were not, we were not scrutinizing that against did that event work or not. Um, you look at the data in hindsight, you could look at the data that we did events for versus that we didn't do events. So it's not to say you don't scrutinize it, but we basically built it into the CAC for a specific segment. Um, the next thing that you have is uh, expand accounts. Um, this one is actually a lot more challenging because the data that companies have inside of it is far less robust and far less mature than the investments that are used to you know, capture a initial customer. And so expand accounts, most companies will have a customer marketing budget. Many companies will run customer marketing as a, dig as a digital strategy. A portion of the advertising budget will go to accounts to expand them, especially PLG companies, but many primarily sales-led companies will do the same thing. Um, and so being able to evaluate the success of those investments, I, I do think that holdout groups or other forms of statistics will be the main way that companies evaluate that stuff in the future. Um, and then lastly, we have uh, demand creation. Um, and so demand creation is something that I believe will continue to be something that requires many different inputs that are all basically qualitative customer research, that we bring all these inputs in, we have some system to be able to look at them and categorize them and be able to make strategic decisions against them. Uh, Self-reported attribution can be one of them. We see more and more people using the gong recording and asking, how did you hear about us on sales calls? The next step of that will be pushing that data back into the opportunity, categorizing it and tracking it in a much more granular way. Um, we have companies that are having success running surveys. So surveys that ask a question about, do you recognize this brand? Where did you hear about this brand? Things like that. Um, and being able to see from customers that aren't in your funnel, maybe aren't in your database, how are those people hearing about you, which is also very important, um, and collecting those and looking at them and then using your brain as a marketer and a strategist to try and triangulate what are the right decisions that I should make based on this data. All of the data and demand creation is directional. What everyone's looking for with attribution is a perfect answer. You're not going to get a perfect answer when it comes to demand creation. And I think it's an advantage for the people that are able to look at the data and move in the ambiguity to make those decisions. Um, I think it can be a real advantage for people because companies just aren't doing it because they aren't able to get a proper measurement to it. I know many companies that have taken off the self-reported attribution off their form while also getting incredible data about how to do stuff. They just don't use it properly. Um, and so I think that there's a, there is a ton of uh, opportunity for advancement inside of measuring in the demand creation, which is another thing that my new company, Pasetta, will be focused on trying to solve.
All right, love it. Another uh, pre-submitted question we're gonna go to. So at what company stage or milestone should B2B companies start layering on paid media advertising as a key tactic to support marketing strategy? Is it stage of company? Is it marketing maturity? Is it product maturity? What do you think? I think uh, the right time to layer, the way I think about paid advertising is it's gasoline. And if you pour gasoline on the road, it's not going to do anything. If you pour gasoline on a fire, it's going to do something. And so you need to figure out, do I have the fire to pour money with gas with the gasoline on it? Um, and what I think about when I think about the fire is I think about we have a repeatable sales process where we close business. Um, our customers are successful and our CAC to LTV ratios are acceptable and our customer retention is strong. Um, that we have a message that clearly resonates with the market. We know what to say to who in order to to can you know educate a buyer and move them into a buying process. I think those are some of the core things that you need before you invest in a real advertising strategy. Um, so I think those become sort of the key milestones that you want to look at. And the reason is because it's really, really expensive and really, really inefficient to guess about what message works on LinkedIn ads. It's very ineff inefficient and not cost effective to guess what is the right positioning of our company to this segment or which segment should we target? Let's run an ad to all three segments and see who respond. Um, I think that you like the real solution to that is doing product marketing and strategy and figuring out those things and then proving that they work and ena enabling your sales team, proving out the process works, getting it to be repeatable, and then eventually moving that into advertising. I don't think that it's a revenue range. I think that er some companies can figure that out really early. I think that other companies figure it out like later on. Um, I think it's more about sort of having that conversation with yourself to say, do we, re do we know who we're selling to clearly with a message that resonates, we can close them consistently and they're successful and happy when they use the product. I think those are the, the right indicators to look at. If you don't have those things and let's say that your customers aren't successful when they work with you and your average lifetime is five months spending a bunch of money on advertising, all that does is get you more customers that leave after five months and tell a bunch of people that they didn't get any value from you. And then you have a, a spiraling downstream negative word of mouth or negative sentiment around it. It just accelerates the process of more people knowing that you suck. Um, and so I think choosing the right time to add, to invest in advertising uh, based on those factors, is a, is a, those are the right things to look at. Got a follow-up DM here from the chat. When would you recommend using paid to experiment? Like, how do you typically run things, experimenting to different audiences or understanding core value messaging? So uh, I think there is a difference between using this to experiment to say, who is our ICP? or you know, do that, which, which value prop do the, do these people resonate with? There's a difference between experimenting around your strategy and then experimenting inside of a channel with a strategy that works and like tweaking the angle or the messaging or the button or the color or the creative or the objective. Um, and I, so I, I think the latter is smart to do all the time, but I think it's a, it's often a waste of money to have a message that is not proven to work at a company that's doing 500K ARR in revenue and to invest their only marketing budget to try and run it against 10 segments and see which segment responds the best. I think it's just really inefficient. Product marketing is the solution there. Um, and so I think that knowing the, like if you're trying to answer product marketing type questions and then you're using advertising to to be the means of how you answer them, you're probably not going about it the right way. Um, and there are significantly more cost effective and generally just more effective and insightful ways to get that information to make better decisions. I think that's the core, the way I would distinguish it. 
I think that's a great distinction and key takeaway. Another question is about new business and expansion. So do you see companies shifting headcount and budget to focus more on expansion? And then what's your perspective on when to do that? Um, I, I do think that companies are making adjustments in their strategy, um, both on the acquisition side and on the expansion side. I do think that... Uh, that oftentimes they're like marketing is moving closer to NRR, which I'm not sure is like really the right metric for mark. I, I think we need to distinguish between a departmental level objective and a business level objective and having a good NRR is a business level objective that marketing contributes to, but having marketing attached to NRR, I just don't see making a ton as a primary metric. I just don't see making a ton of sense. Um, I do. There are companies that are shifting budget that used to be spent to acquire new customers that is now being used to uh, invest in expanding more customers. So I am seeing companies move some budget there. Again, if you evaluated the budget across the four spectrums, you could understand if you have a relatively balanced investment or not. Um, I see that companies are basically, uh, in order to continue to hit their growth rates, the models that they're putting together they just realize that they're not going to get that much net new revenue. So their net new revenue targets are coming down, but they don't want to lower their whole target. So they're just creating really, really unrealistic targets for expansion revenue that they're not going to hit. And they're just changing the, the type of problem or the metric that they're going to miss in. Um, it's not real. It's not really a solution. Um, it's just change, changing where that problem is going to show up. Um and I think generally that the reason that companies are are shifting their marketing focus from net new business to expanding current customers, the primary reason is because their marketing is ineffective at getting new customers. Um, and the real solution is to fix your fucking marketing and get, get new customers at an appropriate ROI, not to just move the budget to account expansion where the analytics are very cloudy and when the when the majority of the budget gets moved to to expand accounts, what they're going to find when they analyze the data after a year is, wow, we don't know if these investments paid off at all, um, because the analytics are not set up. The analytics are very cloudy and not set up properly, definitely for companies to be able to get those types of insights. Um, so I think it's just it's about trying to solve the right problem. I think that oftentimes in B two B companies, they identify a symptom. And then they create a solution for the symptom rather than solving the root cause issue. Awesome. Got another DM question. People might be a little shy on this first uh, That's all right. We'll episode. get it going over time. We'll get the people coming on live. <laughs> it's a safe space, everyone. Um, this is kind of about expansion and conversion, but in the event context. So they run a lot of different events and they have a lot of different goals of these events. So how would you classify and recommend budget allocation by the different event types that they're running? Yeah, I think, um, I think events, uh, digital also, but events becomes a primary beneficiary of when you look at the, uh, when you look at the investments and you analyze the investments based on the objective of it, between demand creation, intent capture, and pipeline conversion, um, that you and account expansion, that you realize that you run events across that whole spectrum, but you measure all your events like demand capture, um, and so it creates a much different view of the events to say, okay, this user conference that we do that is only for customers, um, we don't invite prospects, we don't invite people in pipeline. That entire budget is really driven with the goal of expanding or retaining our current customer base. And so it should be measured in a specific way that is conducive to that objective. Um, many field events get run for active pipeline. Um, and so to scrutinize those events, saying did that event source a lead doesn't make sense. All the people that are at that event are already in your pipeline. They're way beyond that stage. And so we need to be able to look at that event and say, what is the objective of that event? It's to increase ACV, increase sales velocity, deal size. Those are the objectives inside of why we do that event uh, in the first place. And then perhaps if you're a bigger, more mature organization, to run 50% of your opportunities with that event and 50% without the event, and then understand, is that event really having an impact? And you can use some statistics to figure that out. Um, 
many events. Like if you're buying a trade show booth, I get that you host meetings in there and it makes you like that. Some people will see your sign when they're walking through it. And I, I get that you could argue that the booth has multi-purpose, but the reason that you have a structure that's set up there is the goal is people walk by and see it and come in there and talk to your sales team. Um, and so I think that scrutinizing the booth expenditure of a trade show primarily against demand capture, um, I think would be a, a good way to look at it. And the meetings that you're having to support in, like if you are inviting in pipeline deals to have a meeting in your booth to recognize that you could have that exact same meeting in a coffee shop and it would have the exact same effect without the booth, I think is a core insight to realize that the other things that you're doing outside inside of the booth the booth is not actually required to do most of those things. And you're just trying to do other things to pump up the the perceived ROI of the event. I really think that scrutinizing a trade show booth against intent capture specifically would be the, the proper way to measure that. Um, and then um, against demand creation, like I would consider what we're doing right now, a demand creation activity. Um, and at some point down the line, maybe that you'll come to our website and when we have a, a call together, you would say, I love your event. And we were tracking that with a call recording software and we could say we could be able to track that. Um, and so I think there's a variety of, I just broke down every single type of event and how it fits into this model. I think it creates so much more clarity in the, in the event expenditures about how to quantify success. Yeah, quick follow up. So are you recommending that for every event they has a primary purpose that drives the measurement model? So even if an event is 70% customer and 30% prospect, you have to make that call of what's the primary reason you're investing in this. Uh, I think that you should have a, pri a primary objective inside of the event. Um, yes, I do. Um, I think that, and typically, like, let's just say that you have your user conference, um, and then over time, you want to sort of like open it up further and have prospects come. Uh, the question is, why are you opening it up to have prospects come? And the real reason is because you're not getting enough ROI just having your customers there. And so is the solution to invite prospects to your user conference, or is it to lower your investment in your user conference to a level that makes sense for the results of that event? Um, and again, I would say it's actually just lowering the expenditure of that event and continuing to have your user conference just with customers. Um, I think the there are 100% places where you could make an argument that it spans across these spectrums. But I think philosophically to decide as a team or as an organization, what is this, what is the primary purpose of this event? Um, and then scrutinizing it in that way, I think just, uh, I think it, it's just creates a lot more clarity for, for why, why we're doing certain things and why we're investing, which then allows you to, again, see, are we balanced or imbalanced across these spectrums specifically with our in event strategy? Um, so, yeah. Right, I think we have time for a couple more questions. I'll keep it rolling. So this one says, my advertising budget has been get, getting scrutinized and reduced over the last six months and doesn't look like it is going to increase anytime soon. I want to invest in more organic demand creation strategies in order to involve, evolve our marketing approach and increase pipeline. What other tactics beyond paid and a live event have you seen drive similar results for pipeline and revenue webinars consistently work in the data that we evaluate so like some people are like oh like just an event like these events drive lots of pipeline and revenue for companies and are relatively low cost to produce so i would be remiss not to mention that um so i think webinars broadly is a great low cost you know, scalable strategy, um, being able to then repackage that content and distribute it organic. You don't, you don't have targeting organic and you don't have, you have potential for a lot of reach, but you don't have guaranteed reach 
Um, I think that there for people that are able to develop that skill and isolate content channel buyer and be able to figure like make that work. It's a very powerful thing, um, but requires talent and effort more so than advertising dollars. So you're going to pay either way and takes, I don't like saying it takes more time because it doesn't have to. Um, but you're going to pay for it either way, whether it's in headcount and, and talent or if it's in advertising for that distribution. Um, I think that there's uh, there's something to be said about like the the warm reach out, uh, especially with the right like targeting or signal that, you know, CMO comes and looks at my LinkedIn profile. I see that she just joined a new company one month ago. I make a warm reach out and congratulate her on the new thing and say, hey, these are some of the things I'm seeing with companies like you. Do you want to meet and talk about it? And you use a warm reach out as a way to start a conversation. And then if there is an opportunity. You can take advantage of that. I think that's a that's a low cost solution. Uh, having a like a awareness and brand like I've been able to build, but lucky to build over time definitely helps in that thing. But it could help with people that don't have that level of awareness either. Um, I think those are you know, a couple of examples of quote unquote, like lower cost or non advertising strategies that could be put in place. Um, partners, another one, I can't like go full bore on partner, I think that they're just because um, I haven't been able to unlock it inside of any of my businesses yet. Um, but I do think there's potential opportunity there as well. Follow up from this person just asked about um, content partnerships, like organic part partnerships or um, influencer low cost partnerships as well. What are your thoughts? Um, when I'm talking partnerships, I'm talking like complimentary services to cross sell. I'm talking about affiliate and referral type of partnerships. I, I see influencer as a partnership as well, but I wasn't really attacking it from that angle uh, right now. But um, what I would consider like collaborations, I think is a, it's just a smart way to expand the reach of organic strategies. Me host me hosting the event on Thursday to talk about community versus me hosting it with Dave is good for both me and Dave. And so you can see how like collaborations inside of organic or quote unquote, like le lesser non advertising related content, uh, almost always are beneficial The what I did what we did with Catano over time uh, was beneficial to both Catano and I so I, I there's a tons of opportunities inside of uh, collaborations as a means to create and distribute content. Another follow-up, what if you don't have a large personal brand? How uh, would you collaborate with these people? In 2019, I had 922 LinkedIn followers and almost none of them even used the platform. Everyone starts at, and when I started my LinkedIn profile in 2012, I was at zero. Like everyone starts in the same place. Um, and like, what are the things that you do? You could start a podcast. You can invite key people on that podcast. You're able to learn from them. You can then share the, the information that you have. Then you get 10 likes on a post and 10 likes is more, 10 more than zero. Um, and being able to take th that and chunk it out and build like these, this type of strategy is not created overnight. Um, and what's required to make it truly successful to the level that I've been able to capture is incredibly difficult and requires an exorbitant amount of effort and commitment to the channel that frankly, just most people aren't willing to put in for a sustained period of time. Um, but you definitely, the, the top 1% of athletes get nine, probably 99% of the economics in sports. The top 1% of creators get probably 99% of the economics inside of social and content. It's just something to be like, so you, the figuring out how do I get, what are the actions and behaviors and things that I need to do to be able to target getting in that 1%, I think is a strategy that is worthwhile for the people that are committed to it. That was a good back right. and forth. Yeah. The DMs are coming in hot. Feel Good. free to ask the questions <laughs> publicly, though. We might need um, to extend this to 90 minutes at some point. I'm sure we will. <laughs> um, okay, we have one last question. Mm -hmm. We have about five minutes to wrap up. And uh, this one, I think, is a good one to get your perspective on. Refine Labs promotes ungating content. 
as a key initiative to, impro to improve demand and buyer experience. Are there instances where it makes sense to gate certain types of content or experiences that are beneficial to the buyer in the company? I'm really curious about this since you guys also have the vault. Um, yeah, there, so I think there's a couple of uh, core distinctions here. So like an experience inside of a product is, is quote unquote gated. To get into a free trial of the product, you need to provide your email address and therefore you could view it as gated. So like, uh, there is a point in the process where a company needs your information to actually provide you that experience. Um, when we think about ungating content, what I really want to refocus the conversation on is the 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 rationale as to why we do it. Um, and for many companies, the rationale for why is so that we can get an email address, we can MQL score it, and we can cold call someone that didn't want to talk to us, which is a terrible buying experience overall. Uh, it also changes that they don't distribute that content anywhere else. They link everyone back in social ads to the PDF on their website. And it it fundamentally changes the, the content creation strategy, the distribution strategy, and the buyer experience all centered around a transactional model where we're trying to just get a lead. Um, the times in which like a gated experience makes sense um, I think comes down to two core things. You're either selling a product or you're selling information. Um, SaaS companies aren't selling information. They're creating information as a lead in to try to sell you their product. Um, they're not in the business of selling information. Um, and companies that are in the business of selling information rightfully should be able to chart like gate and, and charge transact for the information that they produce. Um, so I think that is the core distinction of I don't see the vault as gated content. I see the vault as we've created tons of intellectual property that can help lots of marketers that we've invested millions, potentially tens of millions of dollars in developing the IP that someone could access for whatever, a thousand dollars a month and get extreme value from it and avoid mistakes and know the right path. And there is tangible value to those assets, which is why we sell it as a product. Um, so I think the, that's the core distinction. Are you selling the information or are you creating information to try and sell something else? Awesome. Any final closing remarks? Thanks everyone for being here. Um, my plan is to have uh, do this every single Tuesday at this time slot. If people feel strongly of like, hey, like change the time slot, I'd like rather you do it at this time or it would work better for a lot more people or might make someone on my team could join if it was changed would love that feedback it doesn't have to be at this time we just chose it so if you plan on regularly attending which i hope you all do when you can that uh we can adjust the time and the format and stuff with the event to make it as valuable as possible for everyone that wants to attend um and so thank you thank you all for being here we'll be back here again next tuesday um, great seeing some of the faces that I haven't seen in a while. Shout out for the people that attend on video. The people that the video gives me a lot of feedback, so I can see people's faces. I can see when I'm saying something that might not make a lot of sense. So really appreciate the people that are on video as well. Um, thank you all for being here, and we'll see you again next week.